All right, so thanks so much for these uh, very interesting um, initial remarks. Um, what we're going to do next is actually continue along this fancy technology trend. I'm going to ask you about different topics and what you want us to discuss. But before that, um, I thought there, I, I know Barry, for example, would like to comment. And I thought there, I don't know if there was some, perhaps some tension between what Barry was talking about, especially regarding sort of when we think about sort of the cultural dimension here, the identity dimension, how we can think about cohort effects and, and age effects. And it sounded to me that maybe Matthew was pushing back a little bit against that view. I mean, I know you said that on net these cancel out, so actually maybe we shouldn't expect, you know, future changes based on that. But maybe you can follow up a little bit on Matthew and maybe, you know, and Matthew can respond. I think there was um, only one place where there may have been a little bit of tension between um, my view and Matthew's view, and, and this arose when he said uh, Brexit was not like Trump. The implication being that, uh, in, in that the decision in the UK about uh, leaving the EU reflects uh, deep-seated concerns of the political mainstream, that uh, Brits had always had one foot in Europe and one foot outside, and everything else we've been talking about, the short run uh, uh, factors are, are, are simply a, a bit of froth on, on the surface. I would say the same about Trump. Trump embraces populist rhetoric, which is an important uh, uh, aspect of the phenomenon. He em embraces uh, uh, populist modes of campaigning, new technology, which is a traditional uh, populist device. But he is very much in the US political mainstream. The United States has always been a country of isolationism. Uh, Americans have always had a deep and abiding skepticism about government and government regulation. He's a deregulationist. And the United States has a history of racial division, racial animosity, um, stretching back, at, you know, that's its original sin, if you will. And, and Trump capitalizes on that at every turn. So I, I, I think in some sense, he speaks to those mainstream elements uh, of American politics in the same way that Brexiteers can speak to these deep and abiding concerns in, in the British body politic. Well, I, I, don't, I don't fundamentally disagree with that, but I think that when we're talking about populism, there's an inherent temptation to say, well, let's just lump all of these complex movements in together and assume that they've got the same causal drivers. I can't begin to understand the appeal of Salvini unless I begin to understand the history of northern separatism in Italy and in the same way I, I can't possibly understand why a significant number of voters on the left of Britain 60% of Labour seats, in fact, voted to leave the European Union, unless I understand the history of Euroscepticism within mainstream politics. And I think those nuances are important. Um, I think the search for the, the core, the core causal story is important. But look, I mean, if you were being critical of what, what I've been guilty of and what a lot of my fellow, fellow speakers have probably fallen into as well, maybe Torsten came closest. I think we need to think a lot more about the, um, and Barry alluded to this, we need to think about the interaction not only between economics and culture, but also between demand and supply. We are telling a very convinced, well, a very detailed demand side story so far today. It's about long term economic cultural shifts. I think where we're missing something very important are, is how populists on the supply side really galvanize and mobilize those demand side grievances into something quite potent. And there I do think Brexit and Trump are very different, very different. The supply side messaging I think was, was fundamentally different from what Trump was arguing. Um, it was rooted in a, in a national discourse around the European Union, around the lack of perceived democratic accountability, transparency, um, a lot of things that I think have been quite unique to the British discussion for quite a long time. So, so let me ask, I will move on, but since you said you seem to be pushing the notion that we need to have nuance 
we need to think perhaps very sharply about specific cases. And so do you challenge the notion of populism as a useful analytical construct? No, I think it no. is useful. I you mean, think I, it is yeah, useful? I, use, okay. I think national populism we can define as a movement mm -hmm. that prioritizes the interests and the culture of the nation state mm -hmm. against elites that it argues are corrupt, self-serving, or neglectful of the pure common people. I think that's broadly a sort of accepted definition. Mm -hmm. I think the point about left-wing populism prioritizing class, prioritizing economic solidarity uh, is an important um, addition. Populism is a useful construct, but at the same time, we, you know, I remember after Trump's election walking into a bookshop in California and the lady saying, well, if you read uh, Hillbilly Elegy, it's going to tell you everything you want to know about the Trump electorate, right? Which is that it's just automatically reduced to this mm -hmm. white working class backlash mm -hmm. simply among people who have been hit by imports from China. Well, I mean, you know, the large, there were three key tribes to the Brexit vote, and one of the largest were affluent middle-class conservatives who were not struggling financially, who were not struggling economically, who had a really good time of it. But if we, re if we fall into these very simplistic, narrow narratives, we're going to lose some of the important elements, m mainstream Republicans as well, I imagine. Lots of Republicans ended up voting for Trump. It was a reassertion of partisan alignment, and they hadn't been hit hard by globalization at all, hadn't been hit by Chinese imports. I mean, how do we, how do we explain some of, some of those larger tribes within the populist family? 20% of Marine Le Pen's electorate is now LGBT. Right? I mean, it's true. I mean, it's a nice study by um, uh, University of Amsterdam, uh, Zaslov, Andrei Zaslov, and shows that now national populism is becoming more successful among L LGBT communities because they are anxious about preserving same-sex rights in an increasingly diverse society. Now, if we focus only on imports from China or we focus only on um, racism, we're going to miss the nuance of that. That's important. It's really important to understanding this movement. Well, if I was to, to be the, the mediator here of this debate, <laughs> I think it boils down to, to, to more like the scientific approach in economics in the past uh, decades. So, so in economics, we really want to measure something really well and find some shock or some you know, exogenity or some random assignment on, on some particular issues. And on that, we have been really good at saying, oh, at some point, the world decides to bring in China to the world uh, trade system. This affects differentially, let's say, textile versus industrial chemicals. So let's see what happens in some parts of uh, the UK or some parts of the US where you produce a lot of textiles vis-a-vis -vis industrial chemicals. And then we find that you know, people in those communities move to more populist votes. And I think there is a very good scientific argument to do that. Mm. Uh, and that's why this stand of research has been extremely influential. Now, having, and I think this is what Barry stresses, what you point out is that clearly this is not the full story. Mm. Just because we can measure really well trade with China or we can measure very well the impact of the crisis doesn't mean that these are the only two sources mm. that are at play. But I think there is a danger when we try to extrapolate on something that is well identified to some more like a more generic type of point. And I think this is more the difference mm. between policy science and economics. Yeah, but that's a deeper discussion on some. So, yeah. <laughs> just, just perhaps I have to organize something on that. <laughs> uh, to be clear, I'm in favor of nuance too. Okay, <laughs> for the record. Very good. So actually, as I said, I wanted this to be demand-driven. Um, and I think we have a clicker question on the... We, we only have time to... Well, actually, on the, can you move on to what we should be discussing? Exactly. And then what are the uh, options? OK, so number one is, what is populism? Because I don't, it's a little bit of a fuzzy term. And I think maybe if you ask 100 people, you might get 100 different definitions. So maybe we need to first make sure that we all are talking about the same thing. Um, so that's, if you want us to talk about that, uh, then vote. Number one. Whoa. Okay. If you want us to uh, that was quick. D yeah, discuss what causes populism, um, then you click B. Or how we should think about the consequences and impacts of 
of uh, the rise of populism. Okay, so I think we have a, a majority winner here. Uh, what are the effects of populism? Maybe I can just super quickly just bring up one definition to just see that we're all, if you're all on board on that. Uh, so I think if you look at the literature, there seems to be one definition that sort of stands out that a lot of people seem to agree on, which is Kaz Muddy's definition of, of populism. Uh, so if you, I, I'll, I'll read it out. Uh, what it is, and then I'm going to ask you if you roughly agree or don't agree. Uh, an ideology that considers society to be separated into two homogenous and antagonistic groups, the pure people and the corrupt elite, and which argues that politics should be an expression of the general will of the people. Are you roughly on board with that definition? Roughly. Okay. <laughs> what he said. Roughly. Okay, good. All right. So, I mean, we could for sure discuss it for... Um, so, consequences of populism. Let me start with uh, you, Matthew. Because um, you have this book, uh, the latest book. Mm. What was the title? It was, uh, I have the title here. It is National Populism, The Revolt <coughs> Against Liberal Democracy. Mm. I think, especially if we want to think about not the short-run consequences, but perhaps the longer-run consequences, and I think Elias alluded to those uh, towards the end of his talk, is that the, uh, one of the fears of populism uh, or tension that's often brought up is, is it consistent with democracy? And, you know, if, if, if your book is about the revolt about, against liberal mm. democracy, because um, on some level, I guess you could say, what Torsten brought up earlier this morning. Look, you see this new party. Uh, they actually seem to be increasing uh, yeah. representativeness. So it seems highly consistent with the basic notion of representative democracy. But of course, maybe it's not consistent with mm. liberal democracy, which is what your book tends to suggest. Mm. So I think this is a potential consequence of, of, of populism. So it would be interesting to hear your thoughts mm. on, on this. Well, the one thing we're never going to be able to do, you're never going to get rid of populism. Right? So you have this discussion about, is populism a disease? What's the cure? Mm -hmm. um, my view would be, the best we can do is learn to live with populism. Okay? I'm greatly influenced by the work of Margaret Canavan, very interesting thinker on populism. And her thesis, essentially, a very good essay in the 1990s, The Two Faces of Populism, is that populism is as old as democracy. It's entwined deeply with uh, the evolution of democracy, and it thrives off a tension between two different political styles. And she's, she's riffing on Oakeshott, essentially, when she says that there is the politics of pragmatism, which is dry, transactional, managerial, it's Remain, it's Hillary Clinton, it's rational choice, it's cost-benefit analysis. And then there is the politics of faith, the politics of redemption, the politics of ideology, take back control, make America great again, emotion, all of that sort of stuff. And those styles are constantly clashing in politics. And the problem is, if the politics of pragmatism goes too far and politics becomes dry and isn't responsive enough, then the politics of faith uh, reasserts itself. And if the politics of faith goes too far and the politics of redemption goes too far, then the politics of pragmatism will kick back and it will modify Brexit or it will keep Donald Trump in check or it will um, you know, reassert itself somehow through the democratic system. And I, I think you know, if you take a, a sort of macro view of what, what's been going on, I mean, I'm very convinced by that because um, we can never essentially root, root populism out of democracy. It is almost democratic in its own right. I don't think we're seeing a battle over democracy versus fascism, for example. I think most of the populist movements that we have in Europe, with the exception of some in Hungary um, uh, and, and the US, they're not revolutionary, they're reactionary. And I think the key battle that we are witnessing and will continue to witness in our lifetime is between two very different conceptions of democracy. A liberal conception that prioritizes individual rights and a direct conception that prioritizes a majority will. And there are deep fundamental problems with direct democracy but it is a conception of democracy. 
I mean, it's the oldest conception of democracy. And I think the populists are very adept at making the case for the latter. The question now is how do liberal Democrats in the room bring back liberalism, which many voters are feeling is too individualistic and can no longer do the two things that Fukuyama argued it could do. It can satisfy people's struggle for recognition by giving you your individual rights, but now a large section of the population no longer feels recognized. And it's married with the most dynamic economic system that we've ever known, i.e. capitalism. And we've heard this morning how that system is now creating a lot of problems for specific groups of voters. So if we want to reassert liberal democracy, the liberal conception of democracy, I think we've got to answer those two questions. But do you think institutions in the long run is going to change or fundamentally stay the same as a function of, of populism? Well, I think it's up to the people who are in the corridors of power to decide what they're willing to concede. Barry, I'm sure, will disagree. I'm not, perhaps um, the other speakers will disagree. Mm -hmm. But think about what, what would an ideal response to Brexit look like? Take that as an example. How would you ideally respond to Brexit? Right? Because I'm living in this world right now. OK, here are a couple of suggestions. You could reform the House of Lords. You could turn it into a citizens' assembly. You could move some key institutions outside of London to deal with the urban small town divide that we heard. You could invest more seriously in regional inequality. You could invest more seriously in educational inequality. The percentage of high performing schools in London, sending your children to what is classified a high performing school, there, is, there are 70% of schools in London, seven zero, that are high performing. If you live in a town like Blackpool and Hartlepool, the, the percentage is zero. There are no high-performing schools in those towns that voted 70% for Brexit. Obvious policy response. Start dealing with educational inequality. Have we had a debate about it? No. We've had a debate about how to stop Brexit. We've had a debate about it in the United States, or we're having one. I um, find very little um, in, in terms of Matthew's policy prescriptions with which to disagree. I do have my reservations about moving the Bank of England to Birmingham, but otherwise, <laughs> everything you described seemed to me eminently sensible. Uh, I would argue that you underplay the uh, uh, intrinsic authoritarian tendency of populist politicians and movements. It is not only Trump and Orban, but I think it, it is in, in, intrinsic to the uh, the substance of populism and to the political style as well. This uh, lack of respect for established political institutions for checks and balances, uh, you know, obviously for the established way of doing political things that uh, makes populism a, a, a threat to the political status quo, to established uh, political institutions and, um, and so forth. For me, the, uh, the question is, is uh, again, when is the UK going to have that debate about educational uh, inequality? I think we do agree and, and people un understand more broadly what kind of economic and social changes and, and reforms are needed to address the valid concerns of people who find populist politicians appealing. Uh, but we don't understand uh, well yet why some societies and nations are, are, are better able to advance that political agenda than others. And I, I don't think the answer to that question is the same everywhere or the same across history. I'd love to hear your thoughts just quickly, but, but I, I tend to agree with you that there probably isn't one answer here. And if we go back to the Swedish case, for example, and then you mentioned also Viktor Orban, so it seems to be very different scenarios playing out. In Sweden, I mean, I'm Swedish myself, so I know that most uh, the best. I think they're mainly discussing different policy changes. They're not cha this, the discussion is not about fundamentally changing democratic institutions in Sweden, uh, I would argue. Whereas if you look at what happened in Hungary, you know, after nine years of Viktor Orban, you know, it used to be, if you look at this democracy rating, it used to have, you know, highest ratings in, in sort of civil liberties, political rights, media freedom. But then you see over the last, you know, few years, 
they're, you're, you know, they're now at levels of many countries that we wouldn't be considered democracies, right? So, so you see different scenarios playing out. We say that these are both uh, scenar scenarios of populism. Uh, but I'm curious to hear uh, your thoughts on this, and perhaps if you want to speak to the, the Greek experience as well, since you know that very well. <laughs> so let me just make a quick yeah. point on, on this debate. I think that Matthew has it absolutely wrong here. Okay. Uh, and I would agree with uh, Barry to some extent. Now, the debate about inequality in education or whether we should spend more resources on clinics, on schools, uh, rather than lower taxes, is the old debate between traditional right and traditional left. And you know, people in the room may have different views. But here what we see with populism, and we saw it in Greece, although Greece in the end turned out to be more of a positive rather than a negative case, is, it, is there is an attack on the way we have structured our social and economic interactions at least after the end of World War II. It is an attack on the judiciary. The way politics have been conducted is through political parties. You know, I vote for party A, you may vote for party B, but this is the way business and, and, and politics have been done. Here we have an attack on all parties, on all politicians. So going to the Greek case, all old-style politicians were not coined by the populists as being bad politicians. They were portrayed as Germanophiles. My father grew up in an extremely poor place in the Peloponnese, and our house was burned during the German uh, uh, occupation. Our house was attacked because my father happened to be an old-style politician, and he was not, again, a bad politician, a politician who wanted more schools rather than lower taxes. He was a traitor. And I think this is a huge difference of the recent surge of, pol of populism with the old way of thinking about politics. So what happened in Greece is, uh, it was a very extreme case. We had a very strange coalition between a nationalistic party of the far right with a party that was representing the radical left. Many of the parties of the radical left were actually were coming from the traditional communist party. Before the 2015 elections, many politicians of those two parties who uh, they were not aware of the agreement at the very top said, of course we would never form a coalition government with, with the other parties, these are like fascists, or the others would say these are communists. But then this proved to be an extremely stable coalition, which uh, I, I, I'm giving this as a food for thought for, for other countries. Now, in the end, what happened, there was an attack on institutions, and uh, let me make a clarification here. Being a member of the European Union is a core institution. The European Union has a constitutional status uh, according to the all EU member states. Uh, so the EU treaties uh, are at par and according to some legal scholars even at superior level as the local constitution. So it is a, a significant part of it. So what happened in Greece and was very interesting, uh, this coalition, uh, actually now it's mostly the part of, of, of the left uh, of, of the party of, of the left, there was a, an internal, if you like, a, a struggle between those who said, okay, let's attack all the way the institutions. Let's, you know, there were some people who said, okay, let's abolish independent judiciary. Let's abolish independent authorities. Let's leave the Eurozone and effectively the European Union. And there were the more pragmatists who said, okay, what we care is about inequality in education. It's like if like the more traditional left type of agenda. And then, thank God, uh, Prime Minister Tsipras sided with a rationalistic type of uh, the neoclassical, we would call them in economics, uh, uh, dudes, rather than those who want like, a full attack uh, on the institutions. So effectively, what you have, and I think this carries perhaps some lessons to other countries, one part of the populist government became mainstream, or if like more mainstream, emphasizing a bit issues like the one you mentioned in the case of Greece, inequality and opportunity, uh, impact of the European Union on wages, especially of low-income citizens. But effectively, uh, it was, uh, this came at, of course, at a very significant cost uh, uh, to, to the Greek uh, society uh, at large. But I think it was this fundamental tension, and Greece was a very interesting case, because it was a take-it-or-leave-it decision at some point because of exogenous reason. Either you stay in, with those institutions at place, with those rules of the game, this is how Doug North defines institutions, with those rules of the game, you can change the rules, you can redistribute a bit more, or leave and you know, design your own, mm. your own rules. So we I'm, I'm not entirely quickly, sure yeah. what, what we disagree about, though, in that I, 
I but would, the I would, Brexit was not about having better schools. Boris Johnson and, and many of his party wants to abolish the welfare so, state. So just want to, to be it. okay, well just just to be clear, that that's inaccurate. But but the issue around Brexit, it wasn't about schools. But the question was, how do we reply to populism? That's the question. That's the question that now is going to be the most important question in our politics for the next few decades. How do we reply to it? And I think, in, in being fairly simplistic, there are two avenues. One is focusing on the populace themselves and everything they tweet and everything they say. And there is a, dare I say, slightly more sophisticated response, which is trying to resolve the underlying grievances that we've heard about this morning, that we know exist within our social and economic settlement, and trying to outflank populism by dealing with some of those grievances. And with Brexit, it's very clear. The educational effect among kids who left school at 16 and didn't go back into the educational system, support for Brexit was 74%. Okay, Among graduates, it was 22%. Hmm. Um, edu the educational divide is bigger than the divide on income, bigger than the divide on class. Okay, and the educational divide is fundamentally central to not necessarily left-wing populism, but to national populism. So to me, it's an obvious place for us to go, to think about how can we actually deal with that divide. So we got you to talk about Brexit in the end. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So um, we, we are almost out of time. Um, I, th I hope there's... I apologize that it was a very fun and lively discussion, but the consequence and the cost are that we don't have much time for questions, but maybe we have time for one. Yes. I like Matthew's analysis very much where he was proposing that populism is here to stay. And we've experienced this in Switzerland, we have it around with the Swiss uh, People's Party, but we've learned how to deal with it. I think in your analysis how Britain has to deal with it is that you have to introduce proportional representation. I mean, you've had 20% of the Brexit party or UK Independence Party, which was never represented in the parliament. Mm. Switzerland has dealt with this by this proportional representation. I would like to extend it also to the US where you do not, do not have proportional representation and therefore you have large parts of people's interests not represented in the state, uh, in this, on the state level or at the national level. And this leads then to huge pressures then finally to change something without being able to integrate these forces to find then compromises. And I would like to put this uh, notion to the panel here and maybe hear your opinions. I think this is um, precisely right that um, first past the post systems like we have in the US uh, and the UK uh, are subject to populist capture, right? And uh, although the two round presidential system kind of cuts the other way, no electoral system is perfect. But I think um, uh, another way to respond to the populists' concerns is to give them the appropriate minority voice in uh, the parliament, not something that we can do in, in the US political system, for example. One of the ironies of Britain's vote for Brexit is that it's made our politics more European. Our party system is fragmented. We've got populism. We've got four parties now competing in a two-party system. And, uh, and we've got Scotland and Northern Ireland on top of that. Um, the first pass of post system, in my view, I mean, is unsustainable, right? It has to be reformed. And the question is, what, 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 what system do we move to? But as uh, Torsten said this morning, I, I think I'm very won over by this argument that for the groups that are most likely to support populists, blue collar, non-graduate, non when nearly 50% tell the Eurobarometer survey, people like me have no say in government, they have a point and thinking about how we can get there through citizens' assemblies, participatory budgeting, new local initiatives that can give people more of a voice, again, is quite an interesting way of trying to outflank the populace. But we have to be willing to get there. <laughs>
on, Very good. On, yeah. on, on the you know on the other hand, economists up here on the panel, the response to the populist uh, revolt in the United States at the end of the 19th century was uh, referenda. So the reason I ha when I go to the yeah. uh, the voting polls in California, I have to vote on 45 matters, the majority of which I know nothing about, is that was a res perceived response to lack of voice, the corruption of the politicians, and so forth. So be careful what you ask for. <laughs> you do referenda better in Switzerland, I know. All right, very good. So I think we have to wrap up there, actually, because we're running out of time. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for your participation today, and I hope you enjoyed uh, this session.